Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is Christine Comiford. For over 30 years, leadership and culture coach, serial entrepreneur, and New York Times bestselling author, Christine Comiford has helped leaders navigate growth and change. Christine's coaching, consulting, and strategies have created hundreds of billions of dollars in new revenue and company value for her clients. Christine authored Smart Tribes, How Teams Become Brilliant Together, and in January of 2018, she's releasing a brand new book, Power Your Tribe, Create Resilient Teams in Turbulent Times. We welcome Christine Comiford to Year of the Peer podcast. Christine, welcome to Year of the Peer. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Leo. It's <laughs> awesome to be here. You know, one of the questions, as I mentioned to you, that we ask all of our guests when we think about uh, where you are in your life, in terms of your life and your career, um, is to paint a picture for us a little bit as to what that journey has been like for you, number one. And then secondly, and I know your journey is particularly interesting, so I'm excited for our listeners to get uh, acquainted with it, but also maybe to share some of the people who've made a big difference in your life, because our premise really of the show is to talk about who you surround yourself with matters. And it really does matter a great deal. It's mattered to every guest we've had so far. Um, none of them uh, have done what they've done in their lives completely by themselves. And uh, so if you would tell a little bit of your story for us and for our listeners, that would just be a fantastic way to get started. Absolutely. Um, so gosh, uh, very unconventional path. Um, ran away at 16, started working in a human potential lab. We didn't know to call them neuroscience labs back then. And really started studying at 16. Like, And I had a fake ID that did say I was 26. But um, uh, and I was really trying to figure out, like, what is it that make people, certain people succeed and other people not? What is it that makes some people happy and fulfilled and vibrant and other people? Nope. Um, I knew it wasn't money because I'd already seen that growing up because we were, we were fairly well off. And I was like, wow, everybody's so miserable. This is dumb. Um, so really kind of um, trying to understand the human condition. At 17, I became a Buddhist monk. I was a Buddhist monk for seven years. While I was doing that, I was studying computer programming, and once I broke my vows, I called up Microsoft and said, look, Windows is a great idea. It's a bad design. They said, if you're so smart, come fix it. So um, I ended up getting a job at Microsoft as an engineer, um, and I was still at that point a high school dropout. Um, I negotiated my way into uh, UC San Diego, and they had luckily transferred uh, later, many years later, they transferred my credits back, so I ended up officially becoming a high school uh, graduate at 34 years old. Um, but ultimately what I found was that the world is full of painful problems. And if you look for painful problems and you solve them, you have great businesses. Now along the way, I had lots of great mentors. Bill Gates was a amazing mentor of mine. Um, Andy Grove of Intel was a great mentor of mine. All sorts of people that you've never heard of or met were great mentors. And all along the way, I've always had this thing called sensei of the day. Sensei like teacher of the day. Mm -hmm. So every day I'm looking out going, who's my sensei today? And like, you know, a guy sold me a cup of lemonade. It was like this really pivotal moment when I was really discouraged. I still remember this Asian, older Asian gentleman sold me a cup of lemonade. And he said like this really wise thing, you know, like fall down seven times, get up eight. And I still get chills, you know, when I hear that, because like, I was like at the bottom, you know, and he was my sensei that day. So just if we pay attention and every day we look for where is our wise teacher, you know, we find one every single day. So anyway, built and sold five companies after that um, on my seventh company now. Um, and um, people are awesome. And that's what I want to do. I just want to help them navigate change and growth and see how great they are. 
You know, it's interesting about what you said, and I think it's been rather consistent with so many of the guests we've had on, is being curious and realizing that we can learn from everyone we meet. And it could be the people that are around us each and every day. It's someone we meet in an airplane or someone who sells you lemonade or whomever that person is in that day. If we remain open to those lessons and those wise things, as you suggested people say, it's really remarkable what we can take in. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's mind blowing. Yeah. And it just moves me too. how we're so surrounded by support and wisdom, but we have to get out of our heads to see it. <laughs> so how did you get, what, what, what kind of fueled your interest in teams? You know, I'd really love to get a sense of, of kind of, yeah. because obviously your work with, um, with smart tribes and this idea of how do we go from the critter state to the smart state and how, it, because in the end, uh, we all know that we learn better and we can do better when we do it effectively together. And I think a lot of what you've come up with is a real formula for how to be effective. It's not about just putting the right people together in the room and hoping for the best. It's, there's a real method to it. And I would love for you to share kind of, first of all, a how you got interested in it and really got excited about it. And then, of course, talk about you know, what that looks like for you. And I, and I know uh, that you even may have some visual aids for us, you know, uh, which would yes. be great to see as well. So, <laughs> so you know, as, um, as I've been building all these companies, the, the secret sauce is the people. And so I've been trying to figure out, yes, in, so in Smart Tribes, in our current book, it was all about how do we structure people, how do we help people move forward, and I'll go over a couple of tools from Smart Tribes today. In our new book, Power Your Tribe, coming out January 2018, we talk about the emotional foundation of a successful team and the emotions that help us, navigating our emotions that help us move through turbulent times of change and growth. Because creating emotional resilience and agility is huge. See if you've noticed this, Leo. When people are going through a lot of change, all that uncertainty, all that potential fear, et cetera, often we will get stuck, get stuck, or we'll create problems that don't exist, or we'll try to uh, solve problems that are low leverage or don't move the needle. Mm. You know, we're kind of running around what we call critter state, amygdala hijack, fight, flight, freeze. Um, primal uh, survival mode of safe or not, dead or not, and we don't have access to the best part about being human, which is our prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where we say, well, I'm here, and yeah, it isn't totally fun, but I want to be there, and here's how I can get there. It's the problem solving. It's the decision making. It's the language tools. It's the uh, social skills. It's the vision, and all that gets tamped down when we're in that uh, limbic system override, fight, flight, freeze, et cetera. Think of this. A person is learning something new or they are in some uh, change scenario. They have two paths they can follow. They can go, I'm confused. Thus, I'm going to resist that confusion. I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to dismiss what I'm hearing and I'm going to reject learning and moving forward. Path number one very common. Path number two. Um, wow, I'm really confused. I'm going to get curious about that confusion. Um, I'm going to admit that I am confused and it's not very fun, but I'm going to get curious about it. I'm going to start asking questions. What am I confused about? You know, I wonder if anybody else is puzzled. I'm going to be then open-minded. I'm going to get a new perspective and I'm actually going to embrace learning. And here's the thing, um, whatever is happening to us, great teams, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside, it matters what's happening on the inside. You know, nothing is either good or bad, only thinking makes it so. And that's what Shakespeare taught us hundreds of years ago. So the question is, how do we help our team decide what is happening to them is actually not life-threatening and awful? How do we actually reframe what's happening to us, what tools do we use, etc. And I'm going to show my first visual aid. Because when we're going through change scenarios, we are up here, okay? Maybe we're resisting. We're okay. up here, right? Yep. Then what we want to do is we want to start to say, you know what? 
I'm resisting, I'm feeling grumpy, frustrated, irritated. We have to actually connect with ourselves. Only 36% of Americans actually know what they're feeling at any given point. So I'll show you the emotion wheel that we use. And then we go, okay, so is this awful? Can I make new meaning around it? Okay, it's raining and it's cold. Wow, that's awful. Actually, it's raining and it's cold. Oh, the plants are gonna look so awesome after this. The air is gonna be so fresh, right? We choose what reality we want, okay? Then we anchor the outcome and then we help our team become agile. So first we've got to figure out where we are. And the emotion wheel is great for this. And again, 36% from the latest emotional intelligence research by Travis Bradbury shows us that most people don't even know what they're experiencing. So in Power Your Tribe, we have this groovy tool. It's mm. called the emotion wheel. You'll see in the middle, it's mad, sad, scared, and fans out from that, or peaceful, powerful, joyful, and it fans out from that. Mm. We first have to figure out where we are. You know, where are we? And is that working for us? And then we're going to go over some tools, but we want to actually, as a team, expand our identity, okay? The environment is maybe full of change, right? So what behaviors do we want to learn? And I'll show you tools in a sec so we can have greater skills and capabilities so we can change our beliefs and our identity, and ultimately, we can be more connected to our core. So let's talk about kind of how all this happens. And let's unpack it. Um, one more picture. What we call thinking is actually a ton of input that's coming into our mind. And I'm unpacking this because I want us to start to think about how do we process what's happening in the environment and then how do we help our teams, right? Okay. So a bunch of data comes in, right? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic data. We hear stuff, we see stuff, we feel stuff, right? So from what we hear and see, feelings result, then we have beliefs around those feelings. Well, I saw his facial expression and I heard his tone of voice, thus he must be mad at me and I'm going to feel uncomfortable and scared. Okay. Right. Then I'm going to behave as a scared, uncomfortable person and the cycle's going to keep going. So what we want to do is we want to look at what stories are we telling about each other, about the company, about the world, and let's start to actually look at how we can create new stories. And we do this by first catching those distortions, right? As a team, every team has distortions. Always and never is popular, right? Um, discounting the positive is popular. So when we look at, when we all sit down together and we say, wow, we are really stuck, we are making some negative meaning, the question then is, well, what would we like? So first, to get rid of resistance, we have to consent. Yep, this is lousy. I just had this experience the other day. I've been resisting this really obvious thing in my business. I have a person on my team who is really struggling. And I kept thinking, you know, Leo, I'm sure other people listening have, have done this, so I want, to, I want to call myself out. I kept thinking, you know, she just needs to, like, get it together, work more hours, whatever. But what I wasn't paying attention to, because I didn't want to, because it was inconvenient, was that she was really in over her head. So as a good leader, right, as a servant leader of a team that will perform well, I had to consent. I had to stop resisting that she was dropping the ball, missing deadlines, et cetera. And I had to say, okay, Christine, look in the mirror. You know what? She's struggling. It's my job as her leader to sit down with her and say, you know what? This doesn't seem like it's the right role for you because we've tried everything else. So let's just find the right role for you, you know? So once we had that discussion, which was just the other day, she's now more energized. Yes, we are going to be recruiting somebody new. And yeah, that's going to take some time and we all get that. But it just like, it just took this level of tension down. And now we all can be more honest with each other, more kind with each other, et cetera. So I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> you know, um, so a couple things. Uh, one yeah. is I think you, you kind of started by taking us kind of through a sense-making exercise that people tend to go through when they're, when they're trying to kind of figure things out. Um, on one hand, that can happen on a very individual level. On another hand, 
it can be very much people coming together and participating in this. One of the stories that um, was told to me a number of years ago that I just loved, and I'd love to get your response to this, was, anyway, it's a woman, she runs an advertising agency in Tampa, Florida. And this actually has to do with her daughter, who was on a soccer team. And what had happened was the coach had made some kind of a move, you know, and the daughter was kind of rallying the kids around this idea that this isn't good, right? And and getting them a little bit whipped up into a negative frenzy about this, right? Well, mom notices this. Mom calls her daughter over and said, you need to be a leader on this team, not a ringleader. And I'm like, brilliant, you know, uh, way to talk about that. So I guess you know, we've all experienced as leaders situations where we're trying to get something done. We're trying to get people really engaged and and all. And we run into some ringleaders out there. And we know that peers trust one another. So it can be pretty difficult. Um, So what is a leader to do about the ringleader? Yeah, yeah. First of all, (laughs) pick up their handy dandy from Power Your Tribe, distorted thinking decoder, and figure out what are the distortions. It's always like this. Yeah, this change, it's just like all the other changes. Leadership isn't going to listen to us. You know, we're the underdogs, whatever. Um, distortions, right? Blowing things out. So blowing things out of proportion. So first we have to figure out what are, what are the distortions. So we use a distorted thinking decoder to figure out what stories are people telling themselves? Mm. What are they believing about themselves and the world? or the situation or the company. So first we unpack, we come back to mm -hmm, the logical levels of change. So first we look at what's actually happening. I find it's much faster to look at the beliefs and the identity and change here versus just the environment. Because you can make a lot of environmental changes like reorging the company, doesn't fundamentally change the, the beliefs of people and their identity. So go for the beliefs and identity first. So first figure out what they're believing, okay? Then from there, what we need to do is we need to sit down with them and get them to stop focusing on the problem and start focusing on the outcome. Because when they're whipped up in that emotional frenzy and they're stuck, right, in critter state and they're in fight, flight, freeze, safe or not, dead or not, fear, they can't move forward. So we're going to use a tool that I'm going to unpack right now. Everybody grab a pencil or fire up a new Word doc or Google doc or whatever you like. And we're going to ask them the following questions. Ideally, in that situation, we want the ringleader, we want. We might want to ask the ringleader privately and then do a group outcome frame. It's the fastest way to enroll and engage everybody all at once. So for starters, what would you like? Question number one, what would you like? We get what she would not like. She keeps talking about it. Mm. If someone says, um, I want all this bad stuff to stop, okay? So what will having that do for you? So first of all, what would you like? And if they don't know what they would like, look at what they'd not like and switch the positive alternative. I would not like so much stress. So what would you like? I would like more peace, okay? So what would you like? Next question, what will having that do for you? You have to ask this several times, okay? What will having that do for you? How will you feel, right? And then what will having that do for you? And then what will having that do for you? If you can pull somebody through an outcome frame for 15 minutes, their creature neurology not only calms down, but it also says, I actually want that. I'm actually committed to that. Back to the visual auditory kinesthetic, when we use the outcome frame, we're actually taking them visually, auditorily, they're hearing new things, they're feeling new things, we're, we're loading up those three senses as we go to the outcome frame. So question number one, what would you like? Question number two, what will having that do for you? Ask that question number two at least three times. Question number three, how will you know when you have it? I need some proof here, okay? How will you know when you have it? And you have to keep asking that until you get tangible, measurable, specific proof. Question number four, when, where, with whom would you like it? We got to get some scope around this, right? If it's like, you know, uh, I want this within a year, too far out, make a smaller chunk they can get sooner, okay? With everybody. Well, who's the core people? Well, Mary, Bob, and Sue. Do you want this everywhere in your life or just, well, no, I just want this at the office, okay? My favorite question, what a value might you risk or lose? What side effects may occur? 
to get that outcome that you want? This is the ego question. This is where they're going to say, oh, you know, I might not feel as important. Um, gosh, you know, if I step back and really support my team in shining, I might not get so much spotlight. You know, this is where we find out, right? Mm about the entitlement, about the approval seeking, about the desire to control, et cetera, okay? So what we wanna do from there then is go into the last question, what are your next steps? So we actually create an action plan, okay? Great way to help people get unstuck. Outcome frame, takes their focus away from the problem and onto the outcome they wanna create. You know what I love about this though? Um, so, what, what I've been really struck by is so often when we talk about, well, how do we get our teams aligned and engaged and all of that as if there's all, always something wrong with them. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what you've done, I think, here is provide tools for leaders also. In the same way, teams can oftentimes make assumptions about things that drive beliefs that can be negative. Leaders too often jump to conclusions about what they think is going on with that team. And what your tools do, I think, are really effective in helping a leader be able to get the heart of, of what is going on. You know, I read something um, a number of years ago that I just loved. Um, that had to do with the difference between indifference and ambivalence. And the fact that if a team is indifferent and the leader believes they're indifferent, they assume they don't care. They've written it off. They're just kind of doing this. When they're ambivalent, they actually care a whole lot, but they have conflicting feelings. It's like that idea that, okay, if they're going to move my corporate headquarters, love that I'm going to get a new office, hate that I have a, another 30-minute commute, right? So there's all of these things. And unless a leader has the tools to be able to really understand what's going on. They're always going to come up with the right answer to the wrong question, <laughs> you know, in many respects. And, and this is where um, I think what you're talking about right now, it relates to the role of the leader with teams and to really be in touch with what's going on so they can actually get together and work together on, on relevant uh, effective solutions, I think is really powerful. So does that, is that a fair assessment of where, I think yes. you're <laughs> okay. And, and I, and I want to come back to what you said a second ago, because I want to make sure that we're putting the right, uh, or many leaders often put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> so um, let's talk about two things. First of all, yeah, the outcome frame helps us get that feedback, but also let's talk about the feedback frame. Feedback frame something most people, most leaders don't do right. Most of us were taught the feedback sandwich. You're awesome, but you're not totally awesome here. But you're awesome because I feel so weird giving you feedback, okay? It, it confuses the brain. The brain's like, what, am I awesome, am I not awesome? Ah. There's a less kind <laughs> term for that, of course, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's much easier just to say what's working is bing, bing, bing. And what I'd like to see more of is Bong, 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 okay? And then you have to zip it. You have to be quiet and let them process. So, um, so Leo, what's working is uh, your accountability. I love that you are super accountable. Man, if I give you a deadline, it's on time, it's on budget, woo! Love the accountability. What I'd like to see more of is initiative, brainstorming, bringing fresh ideas like you did with the Company X project a few months ago. That initiative, it was gorgeous. More of that, please, okay? We need to be giving people feedback on a very- um, That feedback kind of felt good. That, that feedback good? felt good, right? I mean, because most of the time, it's like a four letter word to most people, feedback. <laughs> You know, I mean, that feedback yeah. felt really good. It, it it had a little kind of Marshall Goldsmith X, um, you know, a feed forward, you know, kind of thing. But it, it's yep. really this idea of building on the positive the way you did it. It made me feel like, wow, this person believes in me. They care about me. And um, I'm ready to go and do more of what, you know, it's been acknowledged I'm already good at. That's cool. Yes. Okay, let's go further there <laughs> on for just a sec. So the feedback frame, what's working is? And what I'd like to see more of is, is something that we do really often, really uh, frequently, and we want to do it. We want to do it in two ways. So we do it face to face, or we do it over webcam if need be. But then it's really great to follow it up with an email. 
because I cannot tell you, just like you said, I cannot tell you how many people say, wow, that was so helpful. I feel so good. Did you, so everybody listening, please notice, watch, maybe rewind for a sec, you know, see what this was like for Leo. Good visuals good auditory, he was speaking to himself during it and having mm. a good experience with it, good feelings. We wanna create the good visual auditory kinesthetic tuplet, if you will, trio. So we use a feedback frame all over the place, up, down, across the org chart. Now as the leader, people aren't gonna give you feedback frames unless you ask for them, okay? We need to normalize feedback, make it not so weird, you know? So I'll email my team saying, Please do, a, please do a feedback frame with me, you know, next Wednesday at two or whatever, because I need to know how I'm doing because I have my own reality distortion field. You know, we all do. Um, you said something a while back that I wanted to touch on. Um, and I wrote just a couple of things down, which is um, nice versus kind and empathy versus compassion. Um, you were talking about kind of leaders not totally being on track with certain things. Um, I want us to just think for a sec about the difference between being nice versus being kind, you know? Um, nice often is, oh, so here's a common question, right? Do I look fat in these jeans? No, you look awesome. Liar, okay? <laughs> Do I look fat in these jeans? You know what? I gotta say, that dress looks a lot better on you. I would pick that, okay? That's kind. You know, you don't need to say, yeah, you totally do look fat in those jeans. Okay, you don't need to like crush the person, but you don't want to lie. So often in business, I find people are so conflict avoidant that they're actually being like fake kind. You know, right. nice isn't helpful. Right. It's not. Be straight with people. Like I had to be the other day because I was being nice and I caught myself. It's like, I'm not helping her. She's struggling in this role. I need to have the guts to sit down with her and say, hey, I get that this role isn't working. Let's find one that is. So really think about everybody, if you're being nice or if you're being kind and you're helping that person grow and you're, and you're consenting to what is so you can move on. Nice is all about resistance. And then I wanna talk about empathy versus compassion. Often as leaders, we get in trouble by being too empathetic. Somebody is suffering and we stand over in their world and like we start suffering with them. You know, it's not useful. It's more useful to say, wow, that looks really hard. You know, how can I be of support to you? That's compassion. And empathy, Richie Davidson did it from, uh, I think it was either with, no, it was uh, University of Michigan, did some great research on empathy versus compassion in his lab. And what he found, which is what we find all the time, is when we are too empathetic, we actually buy the program. Think about when you're watching a movie, right? And you really like the hero, the protagonist. They're going through all this struggle and you're, you start crying too. Oh no, you're getting stressed too. That's empathy. You're buying the program. You're right there in it. You aren't resourceful. You don't have access to your tools. Compassion, you can actually sit next to them, don't buy the program and say, wow, that looks really hard. How can I support you? I, I cannot tell you, Leo, how often I'm seeing this breakdown in teams lately. People being too nice versus kind and people like going all the way into empathy and not just being compassionate. One of the things that I think is really consistent um, throughout as you've been talking here is w when I hear everything from the email follow-up to the feedback to the conversation about kindness and compassion. It's also really a perspective of the leader accepting responsibility that the uh, effective delivery of the message as intended is my responsibility, not the receiver's. And, and I see that you doing that all the time as, as such a really consistent tenet of the difference between leadership communication and people who too often say, hey, it was right there in paragraph eight. Sorry if you missed it. Well, I don't know what to do for you, you kind of thing. Putting the blame on the recipient and not as a leader, really understanding that people, um, as you know, they, they hear things, they feel things, they think about things, they, they, they uh, written follow-up is important. Whatever it takes to make sure that the person has got it 
you know, in terms of the receipt of that message. I think time and time again, as you've talked about this and the role of the leader, you, you really deliver on that um, really well. And, and, you know, so it's just something I noticed as you were, you know, talking about this. Thank you. George Morabian's research. Here's what's so cool. You just said this, but I want to unpack it for a sec. The meaning of the communication is the message received. How many of us have said, I didn't mean that? Oh, right. It doesn't matter that you didn't mean that. Right. What matters is that what they receive. The meaning of the communication is the message received. So we have to look at what are we delivering. Um, 55% of our communication is body posture gesture. Mm. 5%. 38% is vocal tone pace pitch. 7%, only 7% is the content or the words. Here, here's two examples. Um, and tell me which one you believe is true to illustrate this. Um, I'm not mad. Versus. <laughs> I'm not mad, you know? So, so often our body posture gesture, vocal tone, face pitch is betraying us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, Thank I you think for bringing that great. up. <laughs> and, and, and let's face it too, uh, really knowing your audience is, in, 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 and this is really where, you know, again, you've talked about this all along, is giving leaders the tools to know their audience, to know what they're thinking and feeling, so that when it comes to delivering a message and accepting the responsibility for that, they can do that in a way where they can feel some assurance that they can be reasonably effective at it, right? They're not guessing. Um, yep. So I think that that's, that's been really powerful uh, stuff that you've shared. So thanks for that. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, um, that's the hardest part about leadership, isn't it? Man, the hardest part about leadership is just like, you're not getting the results we want, picking up the mirror and saying, how am I creating this? I'm creating this. I got a cop to it. <laughs> well, how many times? My team's when, not working. Yeah, whatever. Go yeah, ahead. Sorry. I mean, there's no question, man. How many times have you had something where an employee may do something and maybe it makes you really mad? So you can react one of two ways. You can get really angry at that employee and, and, you know, make yourself feel really, really good because you've gotten all that off your, you know, out of your system or be thinking about what do I have to do to communicate in a way that will help me get the result that I want, not just to, so that I can vent, you know, and, and too often, you know, obviously when we go to, to vent, that almost never works other than in some short term <laughs> thing like, you know, but then the person wants to quit after it's all over. But I mean, but really kind of getting in touch with who is this person? Um, what message do I need to deliver and how that can be helpful, you know, that where I can help them be successful and get the result that we all want for, for one another. And, uh, you know, I think that's such a key part of the communication piece as well, not to be self-indulgent as a leader, but understand that the communication is for them. It's not for us to hear the sound of our own voice or to hear, you know, all of that. I want to say two things based on what you just said, because there was a lot of wisdom there and I want to unpack it. Um, for starters, this is, if we're feeling really frustrated, it's, again, we don't want to be nice and, and stuff it because we're going to blow up later. What? This is where we grab our emotion wheel from good okay. old Power Your Tribe and we say, wow, I am really frustrated, angry, whatever. And we can say that. We can say to our team, you know, oh, man, I am so angry about this. And you know what? I'm going to move through it. I'm going to move through it in the next few minutes. But I don't want to stuff it and pretend I'm not because I am, you know? Yeah. So everybody, what would need to change to get the result we want? You know, and then zip it and step back. Mm. It, because sometimes you're just too, your flakes are too frosted to do an outcome frame. <laughs> <laughs> too many words. Right? Sometimes it's just like, wow, this is so good. I'm so mad about this. All right, Betty, I'm going to move through it. No heads are going to be torn off. Um, but what would need to change so that we ensure this never happens again? Mm. You know, what would need to change for us to recover from this? You know, exactly. And then shut up 
because they're going to have a bunch of ideas. We, you know, we have to remember that one of the most important things we do as leaders is we help people have insights, their own insights, which is why I love the outcome frame so much. Because Leo's insights, Christine's insights, mm, not as interesting as their own insights that they came up with. That's more emotionally engaging. You know, and they, they own the solution. And I think the other thing, too, is, you know, I mentioned to you before we started, I've done a bunch of um, workshops for CEOs and business leaders this year. And the idea is for them to do essentially a self-assessment of their own peer group. And they get to stick their hands in the clay a little bit with regard to the kinds of conversations they have. So they might think about how can I... Um, you know, inspire these same kind of conversations among my own team members um, and, and what that can mean. And I think that they find that um, in the end, where they get to themselves and where they will discover they will get their team to is the team members coming to their own conclusions will say, you know what, when it comes to my happiness, my productivity, my growth and all that, you know who's responsible for that? Me. And then my fellow team members and then if I need my leader for, for, for something there, then I will call upon them to do that. But it's not constantly looking to the leader thinking, you need to make my life wonderful. You need to make me happy. And you are the sole source of you know, how I feel about this organization and I feel about being on this team. And the, the more that people, I think, when you talk about many things you, you have today, you know, as an employee, to be able to participate in those exercises, to have those kinds of, um, you know, considered conversations that allow people to share their thoughts and their feelings about things, you know, put them ultimately in a position where they get where their own hand here <laughs> can be extremely powerful. Okay, thank you for, for mentioning that because we've been talking about the leader and how the leader needs to be honest and blah, 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 but there's another half because it's a relationship. It's a yeah. handshake. You know, no one's indentured servant here. You know, we chose to collaborate together. This is why also I really can't stand when people say, oh, Susie Q works for me. No, she doesn't. Susie Q works with you. We've yeah. got to change the way we talk about leadership and associate, employee, whatever. Well, people, my boss and all this other kind of stuff. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like not totally cool. Um, because language, with all my work in neurolinguistics, I can tell you one thing for sure. Language structures reality. Language structures reality. So we have this, I keep meaning to write this blog that I still haven't written yet, um, but we call it Employee 101, which is the agreement. Here's what we can do. Here's what we need for you to do. You know, can we decide on that? Here's what the employee is responsible for. Here's what the employer is responsible for. Here's what the team member is responsible for. You know, here's what the leader is responsible for. Because we are in this together. You know, this is something that we, there's you, there's me, and there's the us. The us is what we're creating, and we have an equal part on that. And that's where that triad, I think, is so essential. And I think that there is equal responsibility. So if you have this idea that first of all, I think that consider the leader part of the team, not apart from it. Um, and when they are a part of the team and you've got the leader, you've got the individual employee and you have that group member or that team member, that triad is very powerful in terms of if they believe that they all have equal responsibility for making sure whatever you want to put in the middle, accountability, trust, productivity, happiness, joy, whatever that... <laughs> whatever that looks like, they all play an important part there. And this is, to your point, where you're all working with one another in, in that scenario. And I think it's, it's very powerful. And I think it's probably what we've both seen over the years is being very effective. And when you see teams do that really, really well, it's a sight to see. And it is really it's, fantastic. It's beautiful. <laughs> it is. Everybody's bringing their own unique, beautiful contributions. And that's what makes that creative whole work. You know, I feel like, of course, we could um, probably go for another uh, hour here. I so. <laughs> but I, I do want to, before we run, though, I want to let people know, um, I'd love for you to let them know, first of all, where yes. they can learn more about you and your work and where they can buy your new book. Yes. Okay. So um, I would love for everybody to go to PowerYourTribe.com. Power Your Tribe. Dot com and you can um, learn all about our new book and upcoming book and that's super cool 
and um, we will actually be giving you an, a digital excerpt that you can put up on your site. So awesome. People can grab that as well. Um, the book comes out. It'll be in all the major retailers by the 16th of January, January 16, 2018. If you can't wait, because you probably can't, because we've gone over so many great tools today, you can get Smart Tribes, which is our current book, anywhere. Okay? So Smart Tribes is our current book that has the tools, the structure to create these great teams. Power Your Tribe is our new book, and that helps you uh, avoid that emotional undertow that, that so often breaks teams apart or causes teams to perform at a substandard level and help everybody get emotionally engaged. You know, there's a recipe for emotional engagement. You can actually physiologically create emotional engagement with oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. And so what we teach in Power Your Tribe is how to fire off those two, two neurotransmitters, how to get the body to release that hormone oxytocin and then two neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin. So people feel deeply engaged. They feel safe. They feel that belonging. They feel that mattering. It matters that I'm here individually. We are in this together. We have each other's backs, you know, and then all the creativity and the insights and the aspiration can flow. And teams, as you've seen, Leo, they can go through anything. People are tremendously resilient when they have the right tools. That's what it's about. Thank you so much for joining us today. And for all of our listeners, we've got the holidays coming up. Remember to get your copy of uh, uh, Smart Tribes. Pre-order your copy of uh, Power Your Tribe, and it'll be the ultimate uh, holiday gift for uh, all friends and family and other loved ones. So, Christine, again, thank you so much for being on the show. And look forward to staying connected with you next year, too. Right on. Thank you, Leo. You bet. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. That's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y.com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Cantrell, hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace, Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License.